Good morning. How are you all? It is going to be an anointed word. In fact, it's so anointed, I just accidentally baptized my sermon notes with a bottle of water there before I came up. So you know it's going to be good. Hey, Christmas Eve. Can you believe it? It's already come round again, another year. And uh, what a great time. For many of us, it means holidays, especially kids, if you finish school and, uh, you know, it just means hanging out with friends or... Of course, it means gift giving um, and gift receiving as well. We love that part of of Christmas, the food, of course. Some of us are, how many of us here are traditionalists? You, if it's 40 degrees, you're still having turkey and veggies. Yeah, look at all those traditionalists, love it. Or you might be a barbecue and seafood and salads kind of family. We love that as well, don't we? And just all the festi- festivities, the carols, um, getting together, community, it's a great time, isn't it? But here's the reality for some people at Christmas. It can be difficult. And uh, there's the stress of the preparation beforehand. It's a big day and the lead up to it, can, we can feel overwhelmed. With that, there can be anxiety around things like, oh, what gift do I give to somebody? Are they going to like that present uh, if, I, if I give them that? Um, there can be family difficulties, can't there? And it's difficult when there's, um, there can be issues in family sometimes and getting together on the day that can, can stir up a lot of uh, issues as well. There's even financial struggles. Christmas can be expensive, and so that uh, can be a, a pressure. And so sometimes we can be overwhelmed by those things, and we forget about what Christmas is really all about, which is, of course, Jesus. And that's why we've been doing this series on revealing Jesus, looking at different characters from uh, throughout the Christmas and Nativity story, and, uh, and looking at their responses to Jesus. And this message today we would we called religion versus relationship. Um, when you hear the word religion, I don't know what goes through your mind. Some people today might think uh, stuffy, old traditions, not interested. Um, other people you might think, well, for me it might be attending church on a regular basis, praying, reading a Bible, trying to be a good person, all those kind of kind of things. But here's the point. You can't keep those things up if you don't have a genuine and desire and a reason for it. And so that's where the relationship aspect is so important, so central. Relationship with God or anyone else, really, is all about connection, doing life together, listening to one another, sharing, demonstrating uh, love. And all of that is true of our relationship with God through his son Jesus. And it's not about one or the other in some ways. So we, we can have that, that stuffy, old, traditional, not-for-me attitude, um, and yet there is a place for some of those wonderful traditions uh, in our relationship with Jesus. But we're going to get the relationship right. Now, I'm going to look at a passage this morning from Luke chapter 2. So if you've got a Bible there, flick on over to Luke chapter 2, and we'll have the text up on screen as well in a moment. Um, We've been reading Luke in our Life Journal readings uh, for this month. Now, if you're not sure what, uh, we we produce a uh, a, a year-long Bible reading plan every year. And we've got one ready for next year. You can collect this from our ushers at the end of the service today. And uh, so we read about a chapter a day. And then just a little journal entry to go with that. We read the scripture, observe what it means. Uh, We apply that scripture to our lives and then finish it with uh, praying the truth of that scripture. So we've been reading Luke uh, this month. And I love... Luke's gospel account of Jesus' life. I love all the gospels, but they're very different from one another. So Luke is very different to Matthew and Mark, who were writing to very specific audiences when they wrote uh, their accounts of Jesus' life. One was to the Jewish people at the time, the other one was to the Romans. Um, Luke is very different to John, 
who was writing a very intimate account. John was there. He was one of Jesus' closest friends, one of his disciples. And so John wrote a very personal account of Jesus' life. But with Luke, he's writing with a very broad audience in mind. Uh, He never personally met Jesus in the flesh, and so he was relying on second-hand, third-hand accounts. We think he probably interviewed people like uh, Jesus' mother Mary and maybe Peter, who knows who else he spoke with. Um, And he researched very carefully. There's a lot of geographic detail in the book of Luke. So I reckon he probably looked over maps and sort of um, looked where these things took place. And what we get is not a conflicting version of events, but what we actually get is another piece of the puzzle that completes a very full picture when you look at the Gospels uh, all together. Now let me give you a little bit of context for uh, this passage. Reading from verse 25, and this is uh, an incident that took place just after Jesus was born. So not entirely sure how old he is. He's older than eight days old, but probably not a year old yet. So a few weeks could be a few, few months old. Certainly still small enough to be a baby that's, that's held. And we're going to look at a character who does not traditionally feature in uh, the, the, a lot of the Christmas story, but who I think must have been a wonderful, wonderful man, a real character, and his name is Simeon. I must have read this story a stack of times, but uh, it didn't really jump out to me until I read it uh, this, this time around. And I was overwhelmed by uh, parts of his character and his relationship with God. He has an encounter with Jesus and Mary and Joseph that reveals just what a relationship with God is like, as opposed to someone who's just going through the motions of religion and tradition. Um, He was traditional, he followed the law, he went to temple, but he had a real relationship with with God. So let's pick it up from uh, Luke, and we'll actually read from verse 22, chapter 2, verse 22. It says, When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, so Mary and Joseph were also obedient to the law, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, to God the Father. Because it's written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, which is a pair of doves or two young pigeons. That was their sacrificial uh, process at that time. And so being the faithful, God-fearing parents that they were, Mary and Joseph took Jesus as a baby to the temple to be consecrated, which means set apart or dedicated Uh, to the Lord. Now I want to bring out four things this morning from this story that demonstrate what an authentic relationship with the living God looks like uh, through his son Jesus. So the first thing we're going to talk about this morning from the story is that relationship with Jesus produces spiritual fruit. And we see this in Simeon's life. And I want to introduce you to this character of Simeon and the kind of man that he was. It says in verse 25, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And so moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. In just these couple of verses, we learn a great deal about the kind of person that Simeon was. He's quite elderly, he's towards the end of his life. It says he was righteous. He believed and he practiced right living before God. It says he was devout, he was devoted to God. He wasn't just a once a week thing for him or a maybe kind of thing for him. He was devoted to God. It says he was waiting. Now this is, I think this is a really interesting and important part of his character. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. 
he knew and understood that everything has its own time under God. And if God said, this is going to happen in your lifetime, just wait for it, then Simeon was the kind of guy who believed that to be true, and he waited patiently and expectantly. Now, I think there is something really important about waiting for God's timing and not trying to force things in our own timing. Uh, He was a listener. He listened to God. It said it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. He listened to the Holy Spirit. And he heard that small whisper of God's Spirit prompting him, and he cherished it. He trusted in it. And he was obedient. When the Spirit said to him, move, he got up and he moved into the temple. In other words, he was the kind of person who was walking with God. He was walking with God. I, a couple of years ago, I um, started to make a list of all the different Christian leaders and speakers I have met over the years. I've been part of the church here for a long time. I've been in ministry for, for 25 years. And it occurred to me I've had the privilege of meeting a lot of different Christian leaders. And I started to write down this big, long list. And I reflected on the ones that had impressed me the most. And do you know what's funny? It wasn't the ones that I thought maybe. We've had opportunity to meet some very well-known speakers, but the ones who impressed me the most were the ones who you could tell within a second walked closely with God. They impress you by their authenticity of their relationship with God. And two people came into mind straight away. One was Bayless Conley from the Cottonwood Church in the USA. Some of you might know of his TV program, Answers with Bayless Conley. Um, He was a a conference speaker a couple of times. And uh, I think I just remember particularly on the second time he was with us, he probably came into what was uh, (laughs) chaos because we were all rushing around trying to do conference. And he was just so relaxed and down to earth. And he would just sit next to me in the the front row before a service. I mean, he, he is, he's getting up to preach. I'd be a nervous wreck. I would have been back then anyway. Um, and he used to sit next to me and just go, how you doing? You all right? You all good? How's you know? He just strikes up a conversation with me and asks me how things are going, as if we'd been friends for, for decades. That's a really powerful and important uh, quality. The other one that came to mind was uh, Phil Baker. Some of you might remember Phil from, uh, it was a pastor in Perth many years ago, and um, Unfortunately, through illness, he had to stand back from uh, ministry. But he had that same quality. He could look you in the eye, and there could be 500 people in the room, and yet you knew he was uh, um, focusing his attention on you and giving you his best at that point in time. And those guys just impressed me. Them and, and, and many others that I've met, they had spiritual fruit in their life. It was evident just through their conversation and their manner and their character. So what spiritual fruit? Well, it's listed for us in in the book of Galatians, chapter 5. We've got them up here on our screen. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. That's a really important little bit there. Why is there no law against these things? Because you can't force those things on people. Can you imagine saying, you must be loving and you must be joyful now? That doesn't work, does it? Because when we submit to Jesus and we're filled with his spirit, his law is written on our hearts. We actually want to emulate that fruit in our life. And that's the kind of person that I see Simeon was. If we're going to have an authentic relationship with Jesus, we can't do better to embrace these qualities that Simeon demonstrates. Righteous living, devotion, waiting faithfully, being obedient. So that's the first thing. Relationship with Jesus produces spiritual fruit. The second thing, relationship with Jesus inspires a worshipful response. And uh, there's a couple of people who responded to Jesus in this story, and I'm just going to read them through. Powerful stuff. It says, When the parents brought in the child Jesus, so Mary and Joseph bringing in Jesus to the temple, 
to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and he praised God. Something happened. It was in a split second. He saw that little baby and he knew that this was the Messiah. That's pretty extraordinary, isn't it? And he says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you can now dismiss your servant in peace. Man, this is extraordinary. He was waiting for that moment just to see that little baby, to see the hope of the world. And he says, okay, I'm ready to go now, Lord. My life is full of peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And the child's mother and father, Joseph and Mary, marveled at what was said about him. Wow! Can you imagine? Like, he was thankful to God. He praised God. He acknowledged the fulfillment of the promise that he saw before him. God gave him insight to know that this little baby was going to be the savior of all humanity. Now, there's another worshipful response in this story. Just a couple of verses uh, later, there's an elderly lady called Anna. And we read her story. It says, There was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. She'd lived with her husband just seven years after marriage, and then she was a widow up until the time she was 84. She never left the temple. Can you imagine that? She just lived there in the temple. Can you imagine living in a church here? Don't imagine that. We don't have enough bedding or, or space for it at the moment. But she never left the temple. She just lived there day and night. She worshipped night and day. And she fasted and she prayed. And I read that and I thought, I wonder what she prayed for. You know, I reckon, I reckon she prayed for widows like herself, for children, for orphans. I reckon she was a mum in the faith. And coming up to Mary and Joseph at that very moment, so just after Simeon's blessed them, she gave thanks to God and she spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. So she wasn't just prophetic. She had insight that this baby was the saviour. But she was an evangelist as well. She went and told people, said, you know what? The saviour of the world is here. There's something about Jesus that just instantly inspires people to worship from even before he was born. When Mary knew she was pregnant, she went and told her cousin Elizabeth and the two of them started to worship him together. Of course, we know the story of the wise men who came and sought out Jesus, followed the star to the place where he was and they worshipped him by giving their gifts, the shepherds. And you know what? He still inspires rich worship today when people just get a glimpse of who Jesus is and what he's done by dying on the cross. You can't but help love Jesus the Savior. Isn't that right? What a challenge to be like Simeon and Anna, just beautiful people, beautiful grandparents in the faith who model what it's like to be authentic worshipers. So a relationship with Jesus inspires a worshipful response. Now, this is where it all starts to get a bit touchy-feely. Relationship with Jesus reveals the content of our heart. Now, this is where it starts to get a bit real. So Simeon, he has that word, and then Joseph goes off somewhere. I didn't, he wasn't around. And Simeon turns to Mary, and he just says to Mary... He goes, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your soul too. Like he's saying that to Mary. A uh, a sword will pierce your own soul too. Imagine saying that to a parent about their baby. Like, that's pretty extraordinary, pretty full on. That's a lot to take in. And I think Mary was the kind of person, says she just used to store up all these things in her heart. You know, she didn't kind of go, wow, that was a bit wacky. Dismiss that. She just went, okay, something's going on here. And so I think she just stored these things up in her heart. A um, couple of weeks ago, I mean, Jesus must have been an extraordinary little baby to look at. A couple of weeks ago, when we announced our CFC South plant, 
and uh, we were praying for Pastor Tim and, and Nikki and Pastor Dan and Serenity and Paisalak. And they had their little baby, Tommy. It's Tommy, isn't it? Um, in their arms. And that little boy is just a bundle of joy. You can see the joy of the Lord on his face. And uh, is Dan here this morning? Dan? Mate. I trust that little boy grows up to be a fine man of God, called into ministry just like his parents. I think he's going to be a powerful witness. But Dan knows that there is a time coming very soon when the sin nature is going to kick in. And Tommy's going to learn the word no. Isn't that right? Because you've had four children beforehand. You understand this, don't you? (laughs) They suddenly develop a will of their own. Don't they? No, it's mine. (laughs) We are all born with a sin nature. And we've got to bear our heart to Jesus. Because Jesus sees it all anyway. I mean, that's been my prayer this week. It would have been very easy for me. Christmas week, uh, zone out. I'm just playing bass on Sunday morning. No, I had to be praying, okay, God, check my heart again. I need to be making space for you. And I'm so glad I did. (laughs) (laughs) We have to empty our own wants and desires and make space for him. Think of that Christmas carol, Oh, Holy Night. Beautiful song. And it says, He knows our need. Our weakness is no stranger. He's well acquainted with our weaknesses and needs. And you know, it can be tough, but an authentic relationship with Jesus reveals the kind of person that we are, but it also reveals the kind of person we can be when we submit to him and we allow him to transform us on the inside. And it is tough. Sometimes it does feel like that sword piercing our soul, just like Simeon said to Mary. Jesus cuts right to the heart of the matter. But he doesn't do it to hurt us. He does it to heal us. This is such an important point. When we submit our hearts to him, Jesus reveals the content of our heart. It's a transformational thing. And and maybe there's... Some of you here today that you feel like your heart needs healing. That's what a relationship with Jesus ultimately does. So relationship with Jesus reveals the content of our heart, inspires us to worship, it it produces spiritual fruitness. And the fourth thing I want to share this morning is that relationship with Jesus is the reason for our religious traditions. If you look at Simeon's regard for the religious traditions, you know, he could have just been another Pharisee. Turning up to temple, going through the motions, caught up in the laws that could potentially bind him from a relationship with God. But instead, he practiced those things faithfully through prayer and attending temple and listening for the voice of God. And that actually drew him closer to God. There weren't things that bound him up in, in religious legalism. They actually freed him to worship God. Mary and Joseph as well, their regard for, uh, for, for the traditions it says when, when they brought Jesus uh, to do for him what the custom of the law required, and at the end of the story, when they left, it says they had done everything required by the law of the Lord. They had a respect and a regard for those traditions, not for, the, for tradition's sake, but because they loved the Lord. You know, there's a lot of disregard for organized religions, as it's called in the media sometimes today. And this week alone, I've been reading articles where people are just saying, uh, it's all bad, organized religion is all bad, and there's no doubt that there are some organizations that have been guilty of hindering people rather than helping them. Um, I don't, we don't sweep that under the carpet. But 
But there are so many good organisations and good people too who express the love of Christ in a pure and a powerful and a practical way. And that is what we're called to do as individuals and as a church community. So friends, religion without authentic relationship is really no religion at all. It's just going through the motions. And Jesus wasn't a replacement for the law. When he came, he was a fulfillment of the law. And he still is. A relationship with Jesus makes it the law of our heart. Look what Jesus said uh, in Matthew 5. He said, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets or all the stuff of the Old Testament. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. He was a promise fulfilled. It's one of the reasons why we produce the Life Journal. Not so that it's an additional thing or, or that we have to be bound to, to making sure we read it every day, otherwise we're not good enough as Christians. It's nothing to do with that. It's not for tradition's sake, but it's to facilitate our relationship with Jesus so that we can walk with him stronger each day. You can't know Jesus better than to know his word. Jesus didn't come to remove the law, he came to fulfill it, and he didn't come into the world to condemn the world, he did it to save us. Have a look at this very well-known passage of scripture from John 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. In those two verses of Scripture, we see the Christmas story and the Easter story perfectly summarized. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son to be born as a little baby in a lowly manger. Grew up as a little boy, young man. He lived as a person, but was fully God at the same time. And then it says God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. How did he do that? He did that by dying on a cross for the sins of the world. We can't have the Christmas story without remembering the Easter story as well. As I bring this to a close this morning, we're going to have a time of worship and ministry and prayer. I want to encourage you that this Christmas, we need to look beyond just the celebrations and the stresses. We don't want to go through the motions of just turning up to church or just doing another life journal reading, wading through the routines of the Christian life. We don't want to be just stuck in religion, do we? I want to encourage you, seek a fresh relationship with the living Savior. You might have been following Jesus for many years, but you feel a little bit like you're going through the motions. We need to seek a fresh relationship with him. Make your relationship with Jesus a spiritual activity, just like Simeon faithfully did. Be inspired to worship him more. Allow him that unrestricted access to your heart and find meaning to his word so that it becomes the law of your heart. You know, that's what I had to do. That's what many of us here have had to do come to a personal faith where the relationship becomes real. As I mentioned to you earlier, I grew up in the church. I'm a child of the church. And, uh, but I had to come to a place of personal faith myself. And it's easy sometimes to go through the motions, particularly if you're a regular attender. But there came a time where I couldn't fake it any longer and I had to make sure that my relationship was the real deal. And I 
I remember allowing the Holy Spirit into my life and being changed by that. And he can do it for you as well this morning. Would you bow your heads and let's pray.